Welcome back to the podcast of the Expats in Ukraine podcast. I'm your host, Corey. Yeah, as you probably know, I'm from California. I've been living in Ukraine for, since 2015. Uh, this is only our third episode. So, yeah, I st I'm still doing the introductions. But anyways, I have a really interesting guest. His name is Joe Lindsley. And Joe is an American reporter. He's doing this project where he's reporting from Ukraine every single day since the war started. You know, he'll tell you exactly how many days it's been uh, in just a second. He is also the host of WGN Radio Chicago and Ukrainian Freedom News. So this is Joe Lindsley. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us like everything that you're working on? Corey, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, Joe here in Kiev. And I have every single weekday for two years now, uh, I forget. I, I, what are we at now? 763. For two years, I get 10 minutes from Chicago's WGN radio uh, to to share the story of Ukraine. And my goal has been to help Americans feel like they're here, uh, not just the stories of tragedy, but also of inspiration. And then our team at UkrainianFreedomNews.com uh, is a team of volunteers uh, working to share the reality of Ukraine with uh, the world, especially the U.S., and uh, to raise money and to deliver supplies to the front line. Uh, right now, we're working on delivering drone jamming backpacks. And we have some other projects working with Ukrainska Pravda, independent media here in Kyiv, making podcasts. Uh, and really anything we can do uh, to share the reality of Ukraine, uh, the truth with the world, and uh, bring supplies to Ukraine. Uh, before that, I was living in Ukraine during the pandemic. I'd been traveling the world. Part of the reason I was traveling the world, uh, I once worked at uh, Fox News in New York. I, uh, Fox it's News. like, yeah, it's like the, and I, it was like the mafia. <laughs> I, I quit, but you can't just quit. Yeah, so yeah. I okay. escaped in a car chase. Uh, they made a TV show about some of this story. Russell Crowe played my boss. Some other guy <laughs> played me. And I said, I got I got to get away for a while. And so I was traveling the world. And when the music stopped, so to speak, uh, when the pandemic began and sort yeah. of travel froze, I happened to be in Ukraine. And I oh, said, wow. this is the freest country I've ever seen. And I stayed, and then I was ready to go in 2022, January, you know, go back to the U.S. Yeah. But we knew this was going to happen, this full-scale invasion. And I said, man, it's time to get back to journalism yeah. and tell the story. So that's what I've been doing every day. But, like, what actually, you know, I know you were here when the pandemic happened, and you were kind of, like, stuck here, you know, so to speak. But why did you come to Ukraine? Uh, I, well, I was, I was traveling around the world, and I was invited to give a lecture on media at yeah. the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. I flew from Stockholm. I planned to stay for two weeks. Yeah. I had big plans. I was going to go to Hamburg, Germany next to a concert. You know, all this, you know, the pre-pandemic plans. Uh, my flight was canceled. The borders were closed. And Ukraine, unlike most countries, made it very easy for foreigners. If you didn't mm. want to deal with travel during that time, you yeah. could stay here. Uh, they, they they paused the visa clock. And, and so I, I stayed. And... Uh, I didn't want to deal with all the pandemic craziness that I saw happening around the world. Yeah. And uh, and Ukraine was such a free place to be. And part of it, I was tired of traveling around. And I, mm. uh, I, I, I liked being in one place. And my health got better than it ever had been. <laughs> uh, I think the Ukrainian diet yeah, and, and, and the all. Borscht. Yeah, the borscht. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not chemical food. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and so I was really, I got really healthy during that time. And, uh, and then. I, I said, you know, so I was grateful to this country and I, and I, I, you know, I knew a lot about it because I'd been here for two years. I had visited before. Yeah. Um, but, and I said, okay, now it's my mission to, to share this story to the world. Okay. So, um, in between like pandemic and, you know, um, the full scale invasion, uh, so it's like a couple of years there. This is, I guess the moment you're falling in love. What were you doing in the meantime? You said you were like, I guess, teaching at a university. No, that was just I, I was just one time lecture that brought oh, me here. Okay, that was yeah. enough uh, to get me here. And, um, you know, I mean, the pandemic really did. We forget this now, but it, it, it went up until the full scale invasion. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, you know, Ukraine didn't have many lockdowns, but they were just starting to have their first serious lockdowns. Yeah. In 2022, in January 2022. Uh, and uh, it was very strange. Uh, and then all that went away, of course, uh, on February 24th, 2022. But during that time, uh, I, I, you know, this is such an innovative society. And uh, my mission ever since I left Fox had been to create a better version of media. Yeah. And for the past 20 years, our media uh, in the West uh, and around the world really makes money by stealing our attention. And my, our project here in Ukraine, based in Lviv, was to make media that made money by giving people value, to get mm -hmm. people to pay for it. So we get away from this attention-stealing economy. And we had great big plans. We had you know, a nice pitch deck, uh, a great board of advisors. All of this is building up. Yeah. All of this stopped on February 24th, of course, 2022. Of course, man. You know, and speaking of like, you know, pandemic to shift to kind of the full-scale invasion, I remember like 
everywhere I went, like in Ukraine, you know, up until like the invasion, it was like, you know, wearing masks, you go like on public transport, mask, you know, stuff like this. They were starting to get quite serious. And the full scale invasion happened. And it was like, no, there's more important things to worry about right now. It, it I remember all, <laughs> that, you know, one day it just shifted, you know. Yeah, it all went away. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it actually... It was strange because for the first year and a half of the pandemic, it was very free here. Yeah, uh, I remember there was a uh, there were so many great musicians from all over the world who came to Ukraine because it was open. Yeah, uh, you remember all the tourists who came from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, uh, but especially musically, uh, there was a great Le- uh, Leopolis Jazz Fest that happened in 2021 when the Jazz Fest in New Orleans was canceled, mm-hmm. uh, and so this uh, Ukraine was drawing all these sort of creative people who wanted to be free. But very strangely, in late 2021, early 2022, the pandemic stuff got a bit stricter here. But it, that it was, and I think I would like to see someone study this at some point, because not only did people stop wearing masks, uh, those who wore, uh, but you know, people were sleeping in cold shelters. There was so much stress, and yet there was not a, a huge uptick in disease, including yeah. coronavirus. Uh, and I wonder, I would like to see, to see someone study the effect of adrenaline on our immunity. And those first few months, not many people were getting sick. Yep. Uh, and if you look at, I talked to some doctors and you look at, uh, uh, at some top hospitals here in Ukraine. And I, I asked, uh, for example, one in Dnipro, I said, hey, this was back in 2022. I said, in the summer of 2022, uh, what's the coronavirus situation? And they just laughed. They said it vanished. <laughs> but what's interesting is by about September of 2022, after, you know, we had those first intense months of adrenaline. Yeah. And then when people start to say, oh, geez, this is going on for a long time. That's when people began to get sick with various things in a way that they hadn't those yeah. first intense months. So they were living in horrible conditions and scary uh, situations. But the immunity seems to have been stronger, perhaps because of the adrenaline. And I hope some scientific people do study that. because yeah, I'm sure some nerds are going to study that in I the future. So. Man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but um, I remember like the first days of the pandemic. So I was living in Kiev. So the first days of, of the pandemic, it was like the news, you know, there's like this new virus, coronavirus coming out of, you know, China and Wuhan. And I remember like, I was like, okay, maybe I'll be safe because they're starting to stop like air travel in certain areas. And so I wore a mask like, on the metro. And I was the only one wearing a mask and everyone looked at me because it was all over the news. And they looked at me like, is he sick? Like, is this why he's wearing it? And nobody wanted to sit next to me. I remember it was like so funny. And then, you know, pretty soon, like the weeks after, everyone was wearing masks. But uh, yeah, when it come, came to kind of like, you know, quarantine, I feel like, yeah, at the beginning of uh, beginning of the pandemic, there wasn't really too big of a quarantine. And I remember there was probably like one month or so where they actually shut down the metros like in Kiev and nobody can go anywhere. But I always knew like some underground bars that were always that would always cater to people like after hours yeah well and this i mean this is a, a part of the story that the russian propaganda has told the opposite because they it's a delicate topic in some circles to talk about but the fact is ukraine ukrainians are very free people and yeah. uh but they they're often free in a quiet way there were no major protests here about the pandemic because when the when the government started and this is the case of any policy on any topic, when the government starts to push people too much in a way they don't like it, the people make their displeasure known. Yeah. We've seen this in the wartime. We, we've seen it with uh, uh, even uh, comments President Zelensky made about Crimea the first few months of the war, that people push back. And, and, and this is the Maidan mentality of Ukraine You know, mm-hmm. since 2014. There's always, it's like a fourth branch of government, the, the, the people. The fact that at any moment they can take to the square when they get really angry. That's why this war is happening, yeah. uh, uh, because the people really control control their society. And well, I saw that in the pandemic here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, you would see, OK, the first couple of weeks, some kind of lockdown. And then it was the same in the war. Right. We have like very strict curfew. And then people push the limits more and more. They yeah. just insist on being free and they do it. They sort of they test the waters and then they keep going. No, I really like how you put that. It's like the fourth branch of government, like the people. Yeah. Like, I don't know, it's Ukrainian people. It's just like whenever they don't like something, they just go to the streets. You know, I wish like American people were more like that. But I guess it's like in our society, they keep us too busy to actually protest. And, you know, we we live in like a huge country as well. So it's hard to kind of get a mass gathering of people in one specific place. But, you know, I really admire, you know, how courageous and how diligent like the Ukrainian people are, you know, especially when they seek when they have like some displeasure. And when I first moved to Ukraine, like in 2015, I you know, I was a dumb American. You know, I'm probably still a dumb American. I don't know. But I was a dumb, dumber American uh, back then. And I was like, oh, Ukrainians, Russians. Uh, it's like all the same thing. Like, And of course, it's not. You know, I know that now because I was dumber, like I said back then. 
But the difference that I feel now is like Ukrainian people, they want to be free. You know, Ukrainian people, they have this desire to be free. Whereas like this Russian mindset, it's they've been ruled by czars for like, I don't know, a million years when dinosaurs were around. You know, Russian people were ruled by czars or whatever, you know, and, you know, kings and who cares, you know, but they have like this mentality where that is fine for them. And Ukrainians, they don't want that. And, and Russia keeps like pushing themselves onto Ukraine. We're one people, we're brothers. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I know Ukrainians or Russians are very different people now. Yeah, I think you kind of have two different societies, and that's why this clash is so intense. Russia's is totally vertical society, going back to the days of the Tsar or the Soviets, and, yeah. and Ukraine is totally horizontal. They really don't respect authority. Uh, uh, they respect family and community and society. But uh, and you know, I think we say like we talk about our uh, our perspectives as Americans. The tough question I've asked myself recently: If I had never been to Ukraine, the first time I came to Kiev was in 2018. If I had never been to Ukraine and I was just in America, what would I be, wh what side would I be on right now? <laughs> and this is a scary question, and the answer is not a pretty answer, but it helps me realize. Well, you did work for Fox News, man, so I think I know the answer. Yeah, I, well, I, oh yeah, I mean, I, I, it was, even though I left, I escaped Fox, but yeah, even yeah. then, even to me who escaped Fox, uh, I'm sure I would have come here to seek the truth in some way, but, but without ever coming here, I wouldn't wouldn't know the story of how free these people are. Yeah. Uh, and I think, and the Russians, you know, really smudge o this over, and the, our, the media doesn't do a good job of talking about Maidan. No. Um, the, in fact, the, the, the um, in the February was the 10 year anniversary of the Maidan revolution, and I wanted to talk about it a lot, yeah. uh, day by day, of what happened in that revolution. And uh, that was the week when Navalny died. And so, and that covered up yeah. all the news. But uh, the, the story of Maidan. I think, especially for Americans, for people all over the world who are frustrated, they don't like their governments, they feel that they have no voice, Maidan shows it's possible. Yeah. Uh, it also shows that if you do succeed, if the people succeed in kicking out the corrupt elites, it's very dangerous. That's, what we, that's the only reason we, like every week now, we face billions of dollars of Russian missiles because of Maidan. Yeah. If Maidan never happened... There'd be no need for a war because the Ukraine would be controlled. Yeah. And, and probably Ukrainians would be part of the Russian military and, uh, you know, but causing... You're, you're absolutely right, man. Like, you know, Russia, they may not be like the best at, you know, war, but they're really good at controlling the narrative. They're really good at propaganda and they're really good at spreading all of this, you know, whether it's their bot farms or just kind of like their state controlled media. But I remember, I'll tell you a story. I was... In L.A. and it was 2014, so around Maidan, you know, uh, and I was dating this girl. Forgive me, uh, guys, but I was dating this girl. She's Russian. Uh, yeah, she was from Perm. <laughs> but anyways, like I was with her and her friends for one of her friends birthday and me. I was like so geopolitically inept. Like I didn't know anything about, you know, Ukraine, Russia, Europe, Africa, Asia. Who cares? It's like, you know, Amerocentric at this point. So they were talking about, you know, this revolution and they were talking about the annexation of Crimea because it just happened, you know, hot topic. And so it was we were sitting at Denny's, you know, after like, you know, this birthday party at this club, we're sitting at Denny's and it was four Russian girls and this Ukrainian guy. Uh, and they were talking about it uh, and they were saying like uh, and the, the girls have lived. Keep in mind, the girls have lived in the U.S. for years already, like four or five years, you know, so they, they should be kind of assimilated in some way. But they were saying, like, you know, Crimea, it's like the Russian speaking people like this is our land. And then the Ukrainian guys like, well, it's not your land. You can't just take a land by force. You know, like the people don't want to be there. There was like this kind of illegal referendum and like, no, but the people want to be. And, you know, it's, it's historically our land, so we should just take it. And I see no problem with it. And at the time, I'm like, I don't really care like about this topic. I don't know nothing about it. So I won't jump in. But now looking back on it, I'm like, what the hell is wrong with them? You know, like they've been in the U.S. for so long. You think that they would be kind of more, you know, empathetic to like, you know, geopolitics or something like this or I don't know. It was well, how so empathetic are we always in okay, America okay, to the okay. rights of indigenous uh, okay, okay. Uh, people? And I mean, I, I mean, I think this is and it was an awakening for me, Corey, because mm -hmm. uh, when I came from, also I worked for um, uh, the people that really pushed for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, I got away from that world, but, uh, you know, we we had... I, it, one thing that scares me about America, and we I, we need some kind of awakening. I know there's a hunger to fix things and change things. We have this... In many ways, we're on the way to having a Russian mindset. 
Imper- yeah. cultural imperialism, and the, we're, the, we're the poor victim. Russia, for, it talks about what a great empire it is, but it's always in the language of victimhood. The mm-hmm. world's out to get us and yeah. ruin us. And I see this happening it's the right with Americans. Rhetoric. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's why I think why Russian rhetoric has uh, taken off in America. But I think if you see in some sectors, but Ukraine shows a way out of this. Uh, it shows, A, that we do have responsibility. Like, if your government goes to war, and this is applied to the Germans in the 1930s, if your government unleashes hell on Earth, you are also responsible. Yeah. Because you, you allow your society to be the way it is. And Ukrainians show that you can actually, you can use that responsibility well. Uh, but, yeah, you're right. The Russians, I mean, they are so good at this victim narrative, and it, it percolates down to every level of society. Yeah. So do you remember... Um, the last week of January, and it was one week th- this year, uh, where Ukrainians destroyed three of Russia's most powerful planes. The, uh, the yeah, it was like and, one week. Right, and one week, were, and yeah, it was, okay. it was, it was yeah, dramatic. Yeah. And we've done it a lot more than that, but it was a very intense period. Yeah. And that was not the headline. The headline yeah. was, uh, Russia says Ukraine kills 65 Ukrainian POWs on a, on a, on a plane. Oh, yeah, of course. Of and course. they were so good at... Yeah. Manipulating yeah, the information, the yeah, and then everyone just follows it without stepping back. Even me um, on uh, on WGN, uh, I was asked about that, and for a few seconds, I started. To, I got sucked into it, and was talking about Geneva Conventions and POW. And I said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! We don't have any evidence of this. Mm-hmm. The only story that matters that we have evidence of are these three planes are dead or yeah. gone. That's a huge headline for the underdog. Uh, and so this is what we really have to, you know. Now that I'm aware of these saints, uh, to to push back against this Russian, they're always very. I mean, they, we see this recently with the Moscow. Yeah, this I was going to ask you right yeah. now. Speaking of like spinning the narratives uh, and you know, like conspiracy theories, you know, before you have any proof. Uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on this whole kind of what is it? What was the name of this like mall? crocus? It's crocus, crocus, yeah. a type of flower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. crocus, like city I think. hall. Yeah, that's whatever. what it's called. Yeah, yeah. yeah but anyway, what do you think about this? Because at first they were saying because Putin didn't come out and say right away, like kind of you know do a speech because mm-hmm. you know during nine eleven you know Bush and you know somebody made like a statement, whereas Putin had the. To think and so conspiracy theories were starting to develop saying like oh they were heading to the ukrainian border because they didn't catch these people right away for some reason they'll stop protesters in you know five minutes at navalny's rally but when it comes <laughs> to a massacre in a city mall with tons of people you know dead and injured you know they can't you know find these people where are the police at you know and so there was like kind of like a lot of conspiracy theories um and so he finally came out and i guess he said that they were terrorists radicalized by isis yeah, what do you, what is your take on this, man? Well, uh, my first uh, my first answer, and he, and he was also blaming Ukraine too, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I didn't hear this part exactly. I just saw the headline. He also blames Ukraine. Yeah, they, they yeah. do it for everything. Yeah. And <laughs> my, my first answer to this is uh, because I, I was well, I say the first answer is quite simple. Uh, we can't trust any information that comes out of Russia, and until Russia releases uh, Evan Gerskovich, the Wall Street American Wall Street Journal reporter who for one year as of this week has been in a Russian dungeon, until he is released and allowed to report on events in Moscow, I don't trust anything that happens there, and I have no reason to have any sympathy for anything. So mm-hmm. until you release Evan Gerskovich uh, and allow him to report and allow other people to report, I think we should not take anything. This is my aggressive standpoint uh, to respond to it. And uh, uh, so release Evan Gerskovich, and then, we, then we'll listen to your stories, Russia. And... Yeah. Uh, on he was fr- accused of being a spy, right? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's accused of being a spy. He's been locked up for for a year now. And uh, well, what is the evidence they have? Do they talk about this? Um, uh, yeah, they, they they don't share it with the world. No, no of they, course, yeah, uh, and uh, secret. <laughs> so yeah, but if they want us, but here's where we have to be smarter. Like if they want us to have great sympathy and headlines about yeah. Moscow is mourning, uh, you know, because of this incident, release the reporter so we can know what's going on. That's mm. how, this is how we have to push back on the information war. And based on facts and, uh, and, and, and not let them push us around because, yeah. uh, man, I was in Kharkiv on Friday when this news broke. I mm-hmm. think it was Thursday or Friday when this happened. Yeah. We, we had, I was, uh, The mall shooting, right? The mall shooting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was a concert or whatever. And, uh, or a concert. I had, uh, but you know, that morning was Russia's biggest ever infrastructure attack on Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And, uh, where I was in Kharkiv, 30 miles from Russia, uh, 15 missiles had hit that morning. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, somehow I slept through it. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but there was no uh, power. There was no water. And I was reporting on some TV network and uh, from the dark because I had mm-hmm. no power. I had enough to, to... I finally got a connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was very hard to get cell service. And while I was reporting, all, all they wanted to talk about was the poor people in Moscow and this tragedy, this yeah. concert. And fine, I was 
talking about it a bit. And then there's a Russian Iranian suicide drones flying over my head. Mm -hmm. And then my building shakes from the explosion as one of them crashed. Yeah. And I was trying to tell, I'm on live TV and I'm saying, I'd really love to talk about Moscow, but can I tell you we're under attack? And, and they did it. There's no, no, we want to hear about this Moscow situation. I said, I'm under attack right now from Moscow. Yeah. And, and, and even, and, and so when Moscow is so, the Kremlin uh, and the Russians are so adept at is making their victim story overpower the hell that they're currently unleashing yeah. uh, upon the world. And, and so, and so we, we've had this extraordinary series of attacks. I mean, you experienced it here in Kiev. Yeah. I know Tessa. Um, uh, they hit uh, that uh, the western regions. There were missiles flying over Poland, Polish airspace. Yeah, uh, I very, want to talk with you about that as well. Yeah, man. and yeah. this should be the main topic, but instead mm-hmm. everyone's talking about uh, this, this concert about mm-hmm. which we know very little information uh, because we don't have really great reporters there. And, and then the other thing, no one, of course, is talking about yet another six, two successes, it seems, or more than that. Uh, a couple of days ago in the, off the, in the Crimean Peninsula, uh-huh. uh, Ukrainians destroying uh, yet more Russian ships yeah, uh, yeah. despite having no Navy. So all that gets missed by yeah, the, the, the Black Sea fleet is like almost no more. Man. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Dude. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. And there's like the meme, you know, like um, the Russian Navy is losing to a country with no Navy, yeah. you know, something like this. Yeah. But uh, yeah, speaking about that, that missile that was over Poland, it was like over Poland for like 39 seconds, they said, mm-hmm. something like this. Uh, and I wanted to talk with you about, you know, NATO's response and should it be kind of stronger? Because there was like a, a Russian jet like in 2015, I believe. And it was, you know, testing, you know, the airspace of Turkey. Turkey gave it like, you know, multiple warnings. I think it was like 10 warnings before it entered the airspace. And after 17 seconds, they shot it down. This missile was in the air 40, 39 seconds over Polish airspace. Nothing was done. Sure, it was probably monitored. Is this kind of like something to you know trigger Article 5? Should NATO actually step up and, you know, shoot down these rockets? Should there be kind of something, you know, enforce something at least? You know, what is your take on this? Well, we see that they just they don't want to. Uh, but why? Uh, a lot of it is is fear uh, of, of what, you know. Of escalation? Yeah, but, I hate that word. Because yeah, that word is... Um, what does escalation mean? You know, I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, the, you know, we had this story in the Financial Times last week, and now people are trying to dismiss it. But I, I know enough people in Washington to know that there's a good deal of truth to it. That Washington has been angry, the White House has been angry at Ukraine for using drones, uh, you know, Ukrainian ingenuity, uh, using drones to attack oil refineries mm-hmm. deep within Russia. It's yeah. extraordinary what they've been able to achieve. Yeah. And the White House is angry because of escalation. But you never get to victory without escalation. You don't. It's just, you, well, of course. Yeah. It was on the defensive. Yeah. And so, but so the, our language, and this is what uh, one NATO leader, uh, well, okay, the Baltic leaders are very strong about this, mm. but uh, the president of France, is uh, he's had some kind of moral awakening <laughs> the past weeks. No, I was telling the, the other guest, um, I was saying like, you know, his kind of, his strategy at the beginning of the war, it was like, let me just talk to him. Maybe we can reach an agreement so he doesn't invade. And now he's like, you know, French boots on the ground. Let's go already. Yeah, yeah. He, he's really transformed. I mean, he, yeah. uh, that speech he gave two weeks ago, it was yeah. uh, the night uh, before uh, when you were in Odessa, when Odessa was yeah. hit uh, in a very horrible way. And he, he said, two years ago, we said no tanks to Ukraine. And we sent tanks. Two years ago, we said no medium range weapons, and we sent medium range weapons. And he said, "Well, we 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 have to stop using a vocabulary of limits on ourselves. We need to put limits on Russia." Yeah. And and, and he's he's a he has had a character development in this war. I think yeah. like anyone here, we've all changed a lot in this time, and I, I we see that from Macron. And he even reminded uh, the French people. He said, "We don't have to be afraid." He said, "We're a nuclear power. We are re- we are ready." We are nuclear power. We are ready. We have a doctrine. Yeah. This is the type of aggressive uh, speaking we haven't heard from major Western powers. Uh, maybe a little bit from Boris Johnson in the beginning. Certainly not yeah. from the U.S. And uh, and you don't see this from many NATO countries. But so the question now is, after Macron made that speech, will you know will we see a change in actions? Well, yeah, I was. Yeah, I heard somewhere. I, think, I believe it was like from another guest or something like this. That you know he made these statements, like these strong statements, Macron. And then the EU kind of like backed away from it or something like this, like say, hey, this is not representative of all of us or with EU or NATO or something like this. That, th- yeah. that, those statements, they were strong enough to sort of constitute an action. I mean, it, yeah. it was a, it, it changed. And, you know, I, I don't know if you I, I, I experienced this here in Ukraine. People were inspired. They yeah. were saying Viva la France. So they, they saw some great hope. And if you look on Russian uh, social media and Telegram channels, yeah, I try to avoid they were losing. Yeah, yeah, it's a <laughs> dark, horrible place. And I, yeah. I usually avoid it. But I went on uh, after the speech. 
uh, they were losing. They were losing their minds because <laughs> they were scared. Yeah. And uh, and and the Russians, you know. They're very good at the propaganda. I, I don't know with the Odessa attack if that, I mean, that did cover up the news of Macron's speech. I don't yeah. know if that's connected. But what I did see, uh, trending on Twitter X in the U.S. Mm -hmm. during, in the 24 hours after Macron's speech, was there were tra people were trash talking uh, about uh, Macron's wife. And Candace Owens, who's one of the most popular American commentators, uh, oh, I know Kansas. She got fired recently, right? She did. I, yeah. I, I hope that this had something to do with it because she made this ridiculous video mm -hmm. with 20 million people watched it, uh, at yeah, least yeah. as of the first 24 hours, uh, making ridiculous accusations against Macron's wife, saying that she's not a woman. It was ridiculous. And this was clearly this like, is like, like a Michelle Obama situation. Yeah. Right? Why, <laughs> why, why, would, why would Candace pick, of all days, why did she pick the, the week when Macron made this speech? That follow the money. Clear, well, yeah, I mean, clearly <laughs> she's she's acting on behalf of Russia. There's yeah. no other explanation. But no one in America asked her that. I wish someone would and say, Candace, why why didn't why didn't she talk about this like a year ago? Yeah. And and so the Russians they knew what Macron was preparing to do, and they were deeply threatened by wow. it. Wow. And uh, and so but so but the question is, what you know, will we see? Will that inspire other leaders? Um, you know, the the, the 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 you know, is it is it just going to be wards? And uh, so it is a bit. You know, when you see missiles flying over Polish airspace and, and no mm -hmm. reaction to it, um, you know, that, 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 that's worrying because it sounds like we're, we're kind of stuck in this position. And yeah. I, you know, I was telling you how I was in Kharkiv city a lot recently. That city has been so heavily attacked. Yeah. Uh, they, there's, the missiles always arrive before the air raid alarm can well, How sound. close is it to the border? About 30 miles. 30 miles. Yeah. Okay. And so, and, you know, the Wa Washington refuses to let Ukraine use any of our American-made weapons to attack positions on Russian soil. Is this for fact, or is it just... Because yeah. I heard there was, like, some Russian propaganda saying that, you know, um, they were spreading the news saying that Ukraine can't attack, like, I guess, positions inside of Russia uh, because of X amount, uh, X reason or something like this. But then they kind of... It was disputed, but this is, like, fact, right? Like, the U.S. said this? We cannot use any tools provided by the United States okay. or... There are many weapons that are manufactured by the U.S. and they're, they're donated by other countries, yeah. but they're controlled by the U.S. Uh, we cannot use any of that to hit anything on Russian soil. Because of escalation, right? Be yeah, because, well, yeah, we can go into the psychology and some people are, yeah. are cowards. Some people make maybe make money from defense industry. There's a whole other, there's yeah. a whole... Do you know the, the theory, like, boiling the frog? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. That, that's what they're saying. It's kind of like boiling the frog. Like how you were saying about, you know, in France, how, you know, two years ago they weren't going to do this, and then mm -hmm. they did this. Two years ago they didn't do that, but now they're doing that. So it's kind of like there's a th the theory, uh, boiling the frog, for those who aren't familiar. So it's basically like you do, like you know, a little at a time so that I guess in this case, Russia doesn't feel like it's an escalation because it's such a small difference that they don't really notice. But if you give them all the weapons and all the funds and everything they need up front, then Russia might, you know, be embarrassed and they might have to do something, you know, drastic, you know, like use a tactical nuke or something like this. Well, this is what, they, yeah, and they, they, this is what they've been saying. But I think part of it is, there's another side of it is that, you know, in the first months of the full scale invasion, the, in the first days, especially, the Western powers or capitals were quiet. Yeah, people didn't think Ukraine was going to last, and and then Ukraine keeps surprising, and then and, and there was enough public momentum that governments had to do something, so they began to send weapons, uh, and every time they sent weapons, they worked. Yeah. Uh, like the HIMARS arrived in January, tw I'm sorry, June 2022, the first time they arrived. Up until that point, one Ukrainian city in Donbas was falling every week into Russian hands. It was one a week. And the next city wow. due to fall was Bakhmut. But Bakhmut didn't fall for another, what was it, eight months or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Because of the arrival of the HIMARS. They transformed the situation. But still, with those weapons, uh, Ukrainians could only use them to hit Russians on Ukrainian soil. Yeah. Uh, the, but the, it was a massacre. It was like a bloodbath. Like, I was looking, like, every day on the Battle of Bakhmut, it was like almost a thousand Russian soldiers a day, casualties, not deaths. Oh, especially near the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, was, yeah. it was crazy. Yeah, but, but, but Bakhmut, we forget this, that Bakhmut was due to fall in June 2022. Yeah, yeah. Had those HIMARS not arrived, Bakhmut surely would have fallen then. Yeah, yeah. And then more and more places. And so they, they made a difference. Uh, and we see every time the West does send better and better weapons, and Ukrainians use them, there's no major response from Russia. We see weakness. Yeah. Uh, the, the United Kingdom sent storm shadow missiles, 
And unlike the United States, the UK says you d- do whatever you want, hit anything you want. Yeah. They're yours. And so what does Ukraine do with them? They they hit Crimea and they yeah. hit the the headquarters of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, the yeah. headquarters. That would seem to violate every red line. And that was in, I think it was September of, t- of last year, yeah. 2023. Uh, and we had a period of months with no major Russian missile attacks on u- cities deep within Ukraine. We, yeah. we, Ukraine was crippling uh, Russia's ability to attack, and Russia had to adapt. Russia had to move its fleet. Yeah, further uh, back, yeah. Yeah. And, and so this should give... And the headlines, didn't, didn't, the media doesn't pay attention to it, and so politicians can't go to their constituents and say, hey, look... We don't have to be afraid. Russia's a big bad wolf. When when Ukrainians use these powerful weapons and they actually do something very effective, Russia is on its heels. Yeah, but but people in the U.S., I, I feel like a certain type of people, uh, you know, typically on the right side, they're sympathetic to Russia. You know, like I've seen, I watch these kind of interviews at like Trump rallies or something like this, and they talk about it's like Ukraine and Russia. Like, shouldn't we help Ukraine more? Like, no, like, you know, it's historically Russian. Land. And they're like basically repeating word for word, like Russian propaganda. And it's so scary that it's like seeped into kind of like the American psyche of a certain type of people. I don't know. Like, it, it's so wild to me because you can say what you just said to like somebody like on the right about, you know, if we give them these weapons and they'll say like, no, but we should stop the war. And why are we fighting in the first place? And this is like typical Russian talking points, you know, where they want like a stalemate or something like this. Yeah, they've convinced. I mean, and I the Russians going back to Soviet times, probably even the days of the czars, uh, they're very good at controlling. They control people. Yeah. And you control people's narratives and information. I know a little bit about that from my time uh, as a uh, protege of Roger Ailes, the chairman of Fox News, uh, about how you manipulate people. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that experience now, so I cannot be manipulated. And, you know, one part of our American psyche, there's a big wound that Russians use to their advantage. Uh, after 20 years of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, Americans are sick of that, Republicans mm-hmm. and Democrats. We don't, and we don't trust the government when, when, the, whenever they say the word war, you know, think about after 9-11, it would be USA, USA at all yeah. the football games. <laughs> we're, we're not like that now. We, 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 we really don't trust, uh, there's a lot of people who used to, you know, thought, thought George W. Bush was the greatest, including friends of mine who worked with him or, or were top warriors in America. And they've all had this awakening. Wait a second. What, what was all this? Yeah. And, and the Russians know this, that Americans, they're burned by these failed wars in Iraq and especially Afghanistan. And so it's they know it's very easy when you have someone who's wounded about something to prey upon their fears. Yeah. Uh, and so they think Ukraine is simply yet another, you know, it's the government once again saying, let's go to war. Yeah. But if you look closely, the White House in particular has been so reluctant to do anything. They've been dragged into this. And, and every time they do send some more aid, uh, it's always reluctant. Uh, and, and yeah, let's talk about like American politics for a yeah. second, like my, an aide, you know, mm-hmm. since you're on this topic, this is something I want to talk about. Mike Johnson, mm-hmm. he's holding up like, was it $60 billion in aid? Yeah. Since like what, November last mm-hmm. year? What's going on there, man? Well, first is strange, man, because Mike Johnson, Mike Johnson is the speaker of the house, by the speaker way. of the yeah. house. And, uh, he is an evangelical Christian, uh, from Louisiana. And if his, if his people, if his constituents knew this, they would be, they'd be over here to help fight, probably. But at the very least, they would send weapons. Uh, when Russians take occupy, when they occupy Ukrainian territory, one of the first things they do is they destroy other churches that are not Russian Orthodox. And oh. they, they destroy evangelical churches in particular, and Protestant churches. And we have so much evidence in occupied places like Melitopol. Of, uh, they, they, they take an evangel- evangelical church building, they make it into a Russian cultural center, they replace the cross with the Russian, f- cross with the Russian, f- Russian flag. Uh, wow. if, if you go to our website, ukrainianfreedomnews.com, well, I have, we post there a video made by some partners uh, who are telling the story really well. So if Mike Johnson, who talks about being an evangelical Christian, if he really cares about evangelical Christians, the, well, they're under attack anywhere where Russia is, uh, is occupying, uh, is the first thing. But the second on this... There's a bit, there's a lot of politicking on all sides. The, the, the money that Republicans are holding up is necessary to keep sort of the lights on in Kiev, you know, to keep the mm-hmm. government and military and schools and all that. Uh, it's very necessary. Uh, fortunately, Europeans have also stepped up and are, are helping there. But nothing in that package 
it involves uh, tools Ukraine needs to really change the situation. There's, so what is in that package then? Like, um, yeah. uh, there's the package that there is there. Uh, there is money. Part of it is simply like salaries and, and things to, to help mm-hmm. the government keep going. Uh, there's humanitarian things. There's strange things that I would probably vote against, like two billion dollars for refugees. Mm-hmm. Ukrainian refugees are pretty self-sufficient. They're able to send money <laughs> home for drones. Yeah. We don't need that. There's a lot of nonsense in that package. Uh, and uh, the the money that is allocated in that sixty million uh, for 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 military is not new money. It's evaluation of old equipment. Uh, yeah. and, and things we already have and things we're not using. Uh, some of the money might be new for ammunition, but most of it is stuff that uh, we were going to buy. We, we were going to replace anyway. Yeah. This is one thing I, I would like some economists to do. But if there was no full scale war right now here, the, um, the Pentagon is always buying new stuff. Mm-hmm. But now they just put it in the Ukraine bills. And so yeah. it looks like it's all Ukraine. Most of that money is going to American biz- uh, businesses and defense industry. In fact, mm-hmm. 2023 was the best year ever, ever. For sales of American defense products, because they had yeah, this please. nice little boondoggle, they they uh, the boondoggle. longer this goes on, that. it's a boondoggle. <laughs> yeah, I know a little it. bit about defense industry <laughs> from my days with the neocons. Yeah, um, uh, like the Institute for the Study of War people were funded by defense industry, huh. and the the longer this goes on, uh, the you know the, so pre- preventing Ukraine from having a quick victory, it makes more and more European countries afraid. Mm-hmm. Of what Russia could do, and so they were buying the best stuff they can get. Yep. You know, and so we we gave United States gave uh, like I forget now thirty nine HIMARS to Ukraine. It was one of the best free samples you could imagine because Poland saw that they saw how amazing the HIMARS are. Yeah. And they're buying four hundred and eighty six, <laughs> buying yeah. ten billion dollar yeah. deal. Uh, we're we. It's like you give a cookie away at a bakery, and someone buys every every pastry. Like, uh, so this is actually really benefiting the U.S. Uh, but in that sixty uh, billion, uh, it's important, but but it misses, it it sort of absolves the White House of leadership responsibility because mm-hmm. even if that that those that package is passed, the White House still refuses to give Ukraine the long range weapons it needs, medium range weapons it needs, and permission to use them. And this is this is part of the problem, man, because the Republicans, one of their arguments is we don't see an end game. And yeah. I have to say, if you. When I listen to what Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, says, if, I, if that was all I had, my only picture I had about Ukraine, mm-hmm. I would say I don't see an end game. I don't see a reason to be inspired. Yeah, yeah. I just see a boondoggle. Uh, so I understand. I mean, the Republicans could educate themselves more in this, but I do say I understand that they don't see leadership from the White House, and 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 the White House is reluctant. Uh, you know, in, in the State of the Union address, you know, Biden could have said, "I'm going to." Uh, instead of just speaking strong words, we're going to send attack him to Ukraine. Yeah. He did it. Uh, a week later, they said, we'll send a few. But they're, they're choosing not to be forceful. So there's a leadership vacuum, uh, the, and the Russians play upon this very well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, speaking of, like, you know, no, like they don't understand how it's going to end, or, you know, it's not clear. In your opinion, how do you think this will end? And will it end anytime soon? Like, because me, like, uh, my opinion is that you know, Russia is not going to stop unless it is stopped. Ukraine is like in this sunk cost fallacy situation where they've lost so many people, uh, you know, really good people. They've, I don't know, half their country, like 30% or what is it, 20, 30% of their country has been, you know, annihilated. You know, so it's kind of like if we stop now, then all of it was for what? Yeah. Yeah. So how, how, how do you think it's going to end? What was your opinion on this? Well, first, I mean, we have to look at it like we're going up a very, uh, a very difficult mountain. And if we only think about getting to the top and whatever that means and what the view is going to look like, we're going to miss our steps right now. Mm -hmm. And we got to have, we get victory after victory. And with every victory, uh, you see new possibilities of what can be done. And, you know, could you have, could anyone have imagined two years ago that there would be a a, a near coup in Moscow, that Wagner would be marching on Moscow? I know it didn't work. But that was so a, close to something good. It was good. a huge sign yeah. of weakness. <laughs> yeah. Whatever it was, maybe some of it was a theater, but... Yeah, Prigozhin um, was like also like a very bad guy, but... Yeah, but, you know, but, I mean, yeah. Like, but once that happened, so I know many Ukrainians who've been working on the breakup of the Russian Federation with people within Russia. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's all these republics that are oppressed. And yeah. uh, no one, everyone thought it was impossible that anything like that could happen until this Prigozhin almost coup happened. And then all yeah. of a sudden people begin to see new possibilities. So the job of Ukrainians is to carve out possibilities and that's what they've done like you were here I mean, you've been here the whole time 
uh, last winter, two winters ago, so winter of 20, 22 to 20, 23, yeah. that was like living in the Middle Ages. Oh, yeah, there was like no electricity in my flat. I didn't horrible. have water as well. Like, yeah. yeah. It you was remember, like, like so getting bad. stuck yeah. in elevators. Yeah, no, I, I lived on the 13th floor back then. And so, like, when the electricity would go out, I'm like, oh, man, I have to walk up walk 15 up to... flights. <laughs> and they had the care packages in the yeah, elevators. Yeah, yeah, In the elevators, yeah. They had the care packages yeah. too. Wow. Yeah. I always carried a flask with me just in case <laughs> I got stuck. Uh, and... You didn't bring it today, though. I know. I forgot it today, man. <laughs> it's my Don Bosch flask, <laughs> flask uh, for, for bad moments. But, uh, you know, it's so, it's so hard. Like, people were living by candlelight. They adapted. Yeah, yeah. And, and it didn't work. And it, it, in fact, the Ukrainians adapted so well that this past winter, how many times did we have, did you have power outage this past winter? Not really, no. No. Until yeah. the, 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 the couple of days ago, but it's spring. Yeah. So this is a success. And it, the media doesn't talk about it. It's hard to see the absence of a problem, but this is a huge success. Yeah. Like Ukrainians are showing uh, more and more possibility. The city of Kharkiv, and again, the reason why I go there a lot, there's more life in that city now than there was one year ago. There are businesses reopening. There are new businesses starting. Even though like there, uh, there's a cafe that the Russians bombed in January, and I was just there a few days ago, and it's reopened. Even though wow. it could get bombed tomorrow, they don't care. They keep. I mean, they care about uh, never giving up. And uh, this, more if more people can see this, you see, we begin to see what victory could mean. You you protect more and more cities, and if the U.S. would send. Uh, Patriot missiles and better air defense to a place like Odessa yeah. and Kharkiv, and then also crucially send uh, uh, high Mars and attack him and let Ukrainians create a new buffer zone. So hit places within Russia and force the Russians to attack from further away. Yeah, yeah. And then you begin to see that the cities become safer. And then, and then yeah. so model for model, step by step. Uh, and I think that's how we have to approach. Yeah, no, like, uh, yeah, I was living in Odessa and. You know, in a lot of ways, I feel like, you know, Kiev is like a lot safer. They have better like air defense there. Sure. Like Odessa has, you know, good air defense. I believe what is like the third biggest city in Ukraine. Right. Probably. It's yeah. all different now because of the yeah, yeah, yeah. people okay. moving around. But yeah, like uh, like I was telling you before, kind of like the podcast, like I've seen kind of, you know, rockets in the air, um, you know, at night, especially like uh, I believe it was New Year's night. There was a lot of explosions. You know, Russians, are, I feel like they're very symbolic people. They always like to attack on certain events or certain like, you know, historical dates or something like this. It, it's very like sadistic to me. But um, anyways, like in Odessa, like. It doesn't really feel safe at all, really. Like last yesterday, uh, there was like this attack, and then I was in a cafe. There was an explosion. Looked around at the people like around me, um, and everyone was kind of like you know looking at each other, like what should we do? And then everyone calmed down, and I was like, okay, maybe I'll just pay, pack my stuff, because I had no electricity, so I was just charging my stuff there and like working a bit. And I was packing my stuff to go, and there was a louder explosion. I don't know where it was. It was like you know, quite recent. Uh, so I haven't kind of understood where it was and maybe it's better not to know because of, you know, we don't want to give Intel to kind of Russians on what they're hitting, but it's kind of like scary, you know, in a lot of ways And Kyiv, they got attacked like very bad the other day as well. And speaking of what you were saying about, you know, resiliency and how like at a cafe was attacked, but it was open, like, you know, uh, really quick or quite quickly afterward, there was a cafe like here in Kyiv and it was near like the near met new metro name station Zirnitskia. I don't know. No, okay, anyways. Yeah. So it was like in that area in Pachersk area. And a rocket hit near there. The w front window blew out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then like the mannequin that was in front of the front window, it fell like near the coffee machine. I've seen kind of like the, they have like, you know, surveillance inside of the, um, the co uh, co coffee shop and they released it. And within like, I don't know, like an hour or something like this, two hours, they were reopened. They were serving coffee. Window was still blown out. Mannequin was just still leaning over the counter. But everyone came to show their support. And even some of my friends that were in Kiev, they came, they showed their support. And one of them took a picture of the tip jar and it was like overflowing, <laughs> you know, and apparently like he was talking to them. They said they they made enough money to like kind of repair like their window and their kind of like cafe. And it was I don't know it's they're such resilient people. And I like this about Ukraine. And, it, and it's so sad that it comes with experience. Like these last two years, you kind of have to be resilient. Yeah. You know, it, it, at the beginning of the war, maybe it's like harder to learn. But, you know, Ukrainian people have learned it, you know, unfortunately through Russian rockets. Yeah, and they've learned it. And it's something that could inspire Americans. If yeah. they and there's a weird black hole about this. Like the Joe Rogan crowd, they love talking about self-help and, you know, be the best version of yourself. And they miss this. They miss yeah. these amazing stories. Uh, and I saw a video from that coffee shop you were talking about. Yeah. The girl was working in the ruins. You could tell she's shaken. 
And she's but smiling and saying, I love coffee. I want to give people good coffee in this difficult yeah. day. And she's making like a nice cappuccino uh, with latte art, you know? Yeah, window's and, still blown out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like <laughs> half in her face. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, this, you know, we could do a whole series just about coffee shops uh, under fire in yeah. Ukraine from, from Nikopol, a city that uh, on the on the reservoir across the largest nuclear plant in Europe. That city is Kherson been, region, right? Uh, it's actually in Dnipro Petrovsk region, okay. uh, but on the on the Dnipro River in the reservoir, okay. and it has been shelled day and night for 21 months now, every wow. day and night, and there are still coffee shops there, and I've been to them right after yeah. shelling, and they they keep going. Sometimes they're, they have pock marks from the from the the shells. Um, there's a girl in uh, Kupiansk, mm-hmm. or some not in Kupiansk, but somewhere near there, so right at the front. And uh, most people have left. She was living abroad for a while. She came home. She manages a coffee stand uh, that's temporarily closed because she got a concussion uh, from an wow. inc- incoming fire. But she, she's brave and keeps going because she wants to make sure that the soldiers and um, foreign workers there uh, have coffee. So yeah. she's there at the front. Uh, my coffee shop in uh, Kharkiv uh, was hit one night, and I went there at 8 o'clock the next morning. Uh, just to see what was going on. They opened on time. Their windows were all gone. There was glass everywhere. Wow. Uh, the Christmas tree was blown aside. And, uh, and you know, I think in America, you think everyone would be at least talking about it if, if they even did show up to work. Well, everyone showed up to work. <laughs> the girl at the counter, was, remember, she's like, Joe, the usual today? Yeah, wow. <laughs> this, this, this incredible sense of, uh, and so much of the city had gathered there, uh, people who like to go to that coffee shop, and the sense of it was like a weird reunion and the sense of solidarity. Yeah. Uh, and it's those moments that give you strength and that show you, hey, OK, this is very hellish, but we, we can win. We can see the possibility. Uh, well, totally. It's just like, you know, growing up in the U.S., like, you know, you as well, you know, you feel a relative like safeness, you know, comfort, like nothing ever happens on American soil. Sure, like Hawaii, like I would in the 40s, you know, Pearl Harbor or whatever, but nothing relatively happens like on American soil. And so you feel kind of like safe. You grew up with like, you know, in a comfortable life, everything you needed. Like we had a really good middle class when I was like younger. Um, nowadays, it's kind of like shrinking. But, you know, my girlfriend likes to say like I'm from an island because we're so far removed from everything, you know, in Europe. You know, it's like an island. It's just a big island. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, if Americans understood the reality of what's going on in Ukraine, you know, and, I, and actually like what's going on, I just feel like they would be more empathetic, you know? Sure, they'll probably be brainwashed by Russian propaganda still, but at least there'll be some there's more empathy there and we wouldn't have like a 50-50 split on every single social issue or geopolitical issue. I don't know, man. I think this, yeah, Ukraine, if fixing, helping Ukraine can help America. Yeah. And, and, and it can help America feel feel great again. I think it's more, we, we don't feel good about being Americans in some big ways. And man, I think about when I was in the U.S., and like traveling around the country in like 2019 or so. And I remember like just being like in a Walmart or something in the middle of America. And for some reason that scared crap out of me more. Like I, I felt this existential dread. Yeah. What it, just commercialism and what is the point? What is the purpose? We have this deep isolation in America. Yeah. And then I was thinking about this recently you know, under missile attacks, the buildings shaking. Uh, and I've come under artillery fire in places and like, I feel a strange, I feel more scared about the world when yeah. I'm like in a strip mall in the middle of America. There's something that haunts me yeah. and I do here. And it's because there's such a sense of purpose. And uh, from like conservative American veterans of Afghanistan to liberal professors from Harvard who've come here to Ukraine, they all agree. And when they leave Ukraine, I'm sure you've seen this, like almost every person I bring here, when they leave, they have tears in their eyes. They don't want to go. And they say they've had the best conversations they've ever had in their lives yeah. because there's a sense of t- solidarity and, and seeking truth and purpose yeah. that, that we've kind of, we're kind of losing in the U.S. Yeah, I was starting to no, it's it's totally true. Like people in Ukraine are so real, you know, um, you know, in the U.S., you know, when I talk to Ukrainian people, uh, they'll say, like, who is that guy? Like, for example, like Joe, who's Joe? I like, go, oh, it's my friend. We, we did a podcast together. He's your friend. How long do you know him? Like, oh, I just met him today. How is that your friend? You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And because like, you know, sure, the, we have the word acquaintance. Well, who uses acquaintance? You know, I don't know. I don't use it. But people like in Ukraine, when you say someone's a friend, this is like a strong kind of like bond. And mm-hmm. you know, everyone else is kind of like a stranger. And they have a really good sense of community here in Ukraine. And I was like working on this video project for a bit. I haven't really published the first video, but I was interviewing just Ukrainians just talking about, you know, um, the first day of invasion. So I just interviewed them like, what, how was your first day of invasion? And it's like so 
so much struggle that all these people went through. And it's not just like a handful of people. Everyone has their first day of invasion story. I mean, you said you were in, you weren't here. Were you here exactly in Ukraine? I was in Lviv. Oh yeah, that's right. You yeah, were in Lviv. Yeah. So like really quick, what is your first day of invasion story? Like everyone has one. Uh, well, we, we knew this was coming and I, I, I had, you know, from where I used to work, I had friends in Washington and all that, and they were sending me warnings. And I was at the Lviv Jazz Club the night before with just some friends. And in fact, there was a, performing that night was the son of Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, wow. Because there were so many musicians that came here during that pandemic time. Yeah. And, um, and it, was, it was very surreal. And then I went back uh, to my place in Lviv, and I was doing some American media. And then about, I forget what time it was, you know, whenever, whenever it started, I got a text from a girl I know in America who had worked at the Pentagon mm -hmm. and she'd been one of the people warning about this. And she was like saying, Joe, get out of there. And the text simply, it was a quote from uh, the Psalms. And it said, I shall, I think it was, I shall walk through the valley of the shadow of de death, mm -hmm. yet I shall fear no evil. Yeah. That was all she sent me. And when she sent that, I knew it had started. Moments later, I began to uh, get uh, text messages from friends in Kharkiv saying, yeah. they were wow. under, saying they were under fire. And I think... As for everyone, like when people, probably when people arrive here and you cross the border, but for those who, of us, who, we were here, that day was when you, cr you met your fear and you, the fear doesn't go away, but you choose to face it. Yeah. And so that was, that was like the cauldron, that was the, the forge of the courage we would need to face this. And, uh, cause that day we didn't know, we started making Molotov cocktails. Yeah. Uh, we started, we created our Ukrainian freedom news team and our news bunker in Lviv. Yeah. We thought there could be tanks coming down the street. Well, I remember um, like those videos, like on the first days of the war, like my beginning of war story is like not as interesting as yours. Like I'll explain it in just a sec. But I remember like they opened like gun shops, you know, like and you know, people they're handing like normal citizens like guns, like in <laughs> Kiev, maybe not in Lviv, but in Kiev. Like it's so wild. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's it was, it's it was surreal the, people, to look the government back on. was not really ready. This is a story yeah. that would resonate with Americans. It was the people. It was just a civil yeah. society that said we're not going to lose. Yeah. What's, what was what, what was your story? <laughs> okay, so like a uh, week before the invasion, so I was living in Kotsubinsky, which is northern. Um, so it's like near Academic Stageco Metro. So it's near Irpin, Bucha. There's Kiev like a, suburbs. Uh, yeah, 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 Kiev suburbs. Uh, so a week before like the uh, the invasion, I was at my friend's wedding, and it was like a foreign wedding, like Ukrainian girl, uh, Indian guy, a lot of foreign people there, and they were talking about, do so you think they're gonna invade? And at first I was like, no, nah, I don't think they're going to invade. Just like all posturing. Maybe it's like this North Korea situation where they threaten and then we give them something that they want and then they just back off. So I thought it was like some ge geopolitical game like this. And then the more I drank, the more they were talking, the more I think. <laughs> yeah, think. That's, how, that's how it <laughs> yeah. goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then my my friend is like, I have some intel. Somebody from the embassy, they told me they're going to invade. It's like a sure thing. They don't know when it is, but it's going to be the next couple of weeks. And then I told my uh, girlfriend at the time, I said, like, hey, your family lives in Mukacheva. Like, maybe we go there for like a week or two. In the, in the West. In the West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's near Ushgorod, like near the border of uh, Hungary. And so I'm like, okay, we can go there for a week or two. And then if they don't invade, we'll just come back. If we do, then maybe we'll go to the European Union if it gets too unsafe. Uh, and so we packed all our documents. We hid all of our valuable stuff in case there was occupation, which I don't know why I was thinking about at the time. But it was actually a real case because they occupied Irpin and Bucha. Um, so anyway... And, and it's important to remember that we forget all that kind of yeah. hellish turmoil we went through. But yeah, no. And, yeah. and then Mukachev, I was like documenting like every day, like on my phone, just like recording kind of, you know, Biden's speech on the TV when we're watching it, just walking around the neighborhood, just recording. And then towards the end, like right before they invaded, like stuff was kind of going off the shelf even more. There was longer lines, at the ATM. And then right when they invaded, huge lines, of the ATM, uh, there was like nothing on the shelf anymore. They stopped selling alcohol. Um, you know, Mukachev was relatively quiet. You know, because they're, it's like the very western tip, you know, near Hungary. So if a rocket goes there and it's like off by like a few kilometers, maybe it hits like a NATO country or something like this. So I understood it was like quite safe. Never heard an air alarm until I went to Lviv like a couple months after that. Um, but anyway, so I just noticed like this huge change and there was like no more money in the ATMs. The the all like the um the productis the uh what's the word in English? What we call it, like a bodega or something. Bodega, yeah. Like, okay. in New York. Yeah, they like all the food was gone and I don't know. It was just like so surreal, man. And I like to explain this to my American friends. I say like, you know, this is like Ukrainians like 9-11. You know, you, they never forget. It was a, such an important day. Everyone knows what they were doing that day. You know, it's I don't know. And it was and we didn't know what to expect. And, yeah. and, and everything very easily could have turned out in, in a worse way. And uh, I mean, I, I remember walking through the streets of Lviv and, um, you know, even in the pandemic, you always would hear music in the streets. And there was no music that day. There was just yeah. this, it was like it was this weird nightmare. And um 
And then the adrenaline really kicked in. I think it was really the next day that adrenaline kicked in. And so many of us lived off of that for about three months. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it's, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird haunting thing to remember as we, yeah, just yeah. go through. And that's uh, one thing I try to do and I want to do, I keep doing on the show, WGN. And, I'm, you know, I want to keep it up as, and I want to keep it up every day until victory. Yeah. Is to let Americans feel like they're here with us. Because this is, you know, we love superhero stories. Uh, and, and, you know, like blockbuster movies of, you know, good versus evil. Well, this is that every single day. And and not only can you tune in and listen to it, it's interesting, but you can actually be you can be a hero. Yeah. Sitting in your kitchen in California. You can you can donate uh by drones or whatever or anti drone stuff. Uh you, you, you can participate uh for the first time ever, sort of in, in a in a struggle for freedom very from very far away. Yeah, yeah, like when the first days of invasion happened, uh, you know, all my, a lot of my friends from the U.S., they messaged me, how can I help? What can I do? I was like, send money, give them kind of links to um, reliable charities and stuff like this. Some of them wanted to donate goods, so they created a care package for, you know, them and their colleagues at work, and they sent it over to, like, some uh, Novoposta, Mist kind of box, like, in, in the U.S., and they sent it over to kind of Ukraine. It was so wild, like, how, you know, so many people wanted to help. It was, to me, this Ukraine-Russia thing is a clear case of good versus evil. Yeah. If we've ever seen one in our lifetime, you know, you know, Afghanistan, the war in Afghanistan, you know, U.S., Afghanistan, Iraq, it's kind of like who's more evil at this point, yeah. you know, but right now it's like we know which one's good, you know, which one's evil. But, um, you know, it's been really good talking with Joe and I would love to talk with you more, but I feel like we've reached our time for now. You know, I know I just feel like I have so many more things I want to talk with you about, but uh, yeah, we've reached our time. So um, I just want to thank you so much for joining, uh, you know, the podcast. Like I said, it's so interesting talking to you, man. I'm sure like after this, we're going to talk like a lot more. Um, but yeah, so right now would be a good time to plug your socials so everyone can kind of know where to follow you in case they want to. So why don't you go do that right now? Yeah, you can visit us at ukrainianfreedomnews.com. Soon we'll have a new website. But for now, there, there you can find our YouTube channel, uh, my Instagram and Twitter accounts where I share uh, every day my reports from Chicago's WGN Radio. We have a video version of those reports. Just 10 minutes a day while you're on the treadmill or going to work, you know, check in on Ukraine. And uh, we also share interviews with, uh, with great Ukrainians and foreigners here. So maybe we'll, I'll have you on my, my show. Oh, I'd uh, love to free. join, Joe. It'd be great. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, this is an adventure uh, of good versus evil, but uh, it's, all, it, there's, it's not all tragedy. Every day we have stories of inspiration. So uh, I encourage you to, to follow along. Joe Lindsley, UkrainianFreedomNews.com, and reporting every single weekday until victory. On Chicago's WGN Radio. Thank uh, great, you. Joe. And so I also want to thank Gaze Media for, um, you know, letting us do this podcast. Uh, so if you're watching this video and you want to know more about Joe, you want to ask him a question, comment down below. If you uh, want to talk about something that we didn't cover, comment down below as well. I'd appreciate a like, a follow. And if you like Joe's Vishivanka today, you can also comment that, <laughs> that down below as well. But if you want to follow me, I'm Corey.ua uh, um, on all my socials. Uh, Instagram. I'm on TikTok now. I've joined the young crowd, Gen Z. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you can follow me there. I mostly do content about historical or cultural uh, events in Ukraine. So um, yeah, it's it's less warlike. It's more kind of, I guess, fun, inspiring maybe. But anyway, thank you so much for uh, joining us, Joe. Thank you, man. Cheers, man. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah.